Hi everyone, my name is Neil Wu Becker from Cisco, and today I'm joined by Lou Tucker, who is the company's new Chief Technology Officer for Cloud Computing. Lou, thanks for joining us. Hi Neil, great to be here. Great. There are a lot of people who are very eager to hear from you around uh, what you're doing or what your thoughts and plans are with regard to Cisco's strategy, direction as we enter the space uh, more aggressively. I realize you've only been here not even six months, about five sure. and a half. Uh, but you do seem to be getting settled, so I think this would be a good time to, to talk to a lot of people about where your head's at currently. Um, so before we jump into the cloud okay. strategy, I wanted to ask you a question where we kind of take a step back and look at just how the Internet as a whole is evolving, how cloud computing is evolving in parallel, too. And it's safe to say, it seems safe to say that the two are actually rather one and of the same, that the cloud seems to be a manifestation of how this new age of the Internet is playing out. Yeah, Would that, you agree I, with that? Absolutely. In fact, it's sort of a, of a perfect storm forming mm -hmm. here, that between the continued advance of Moore's Law, which is driving down the cost of computing, mm -hmm. now we couple that then with the rise of the Internet mm -hmm. and the explosive growth that we're seeing there and some of the technology changes, such as virtualization. Those forces are coming together that make it possible now for us on demand, uh, for you to be able to get resources through the internet. Mm -hmm. Basic core resources, such as a virtual machine, your mm -hmm. own server, if you'd like, on your own credit card, you can get it. So instead of just getting the kind of services that we've seen, uh, applications through the internet and media and content, now you're getting resources through the internet. Mm -hmm. And that's what cloud computing is really about, so it's, it's, it's a very exciting time. Yeah, in fact, um it seems to be we're also at the beginning, right? No one's too late to be jumping into this at the we, moment. We is, that, are, is that fair we to say? We are very, very much at the beginning of this. So everybody's sort of at the same starting starting line here. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what's, I think, interesting is for us to figure out what will the time course look like? See, what will the adoption rate of cloud computing be like? We are seeing of the last couple of years, for example, Amazon's web services have really been in the forefront of making it possible for web developers and small companies to get into cloud computing. Mm -hmm. And so they're well up on the adoption curve. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're going to Sand Hill Road to get money as a startup, they're not going to give you money to buy infrastructure. Mm -hmm. They're going to say you go and you buy it in the cloud mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. that way they, they lower their risk and it's a pay-as-you-go model. It fits very nicely with that. Surprisingly, though, that the enterprise is now looking at that and going, how are they getting those cost savings? Mm -hmm. How is it that, that they are able to have the market set a price now for computing of, 10 cents per CPU hour. Mm. Uh, so the IT organizations are now taking a very hard look at the cloud computing model mm. and are beginning to adopt it now in the forms of a private cloud for the enterprise itself. Interesting. Well, you know, as, as the space really matures, there's obviously a lot of discussion or debate around how many major cloud providers are, are going to exist, who's going to really dominate and dictate the way this space evolves. Uh, there's one argument that I'm sure you've heard that there's really only going to be a couple or a few major providers, yeah. the yeah. likes of the Amazons and the Googles of the world. Yeah. Are there going to be many clouds or well, not? And, and how know, would you? In, in fact, we don't know how this will unfold, but mm. I'm, I'm really much of the belief that there will be many clouds okay. out there uh, as we have the different needs for the different sort of vertical communities of interest around perhaps government. Mm. There will be government clouds. Mm. Uh, there will be, uh, for the healthcare industry, HIPAA-compliant clouds, mm. for example, in financial services, they have different requirements. When banks want to get together to drive ATMs in the developing world, they're going to want to go to a service provider that can provide the kind of quality clouds that they need. And also that we are starting to see now the enterprise looking at some of our Cisco's customers to see what kinds of enterprise class private clouds can be hosted by service providers. I see. I know you've um, given examples to me offline before, but as this many clouds philosophy plays out, you've talked a lot about... Um, there's going to be a larger cloud. This concept of, you haven't seen anything yet. There is. There can, can you elaborate on that? There, there is, there's, there's a much larger cloud on the horizon. As we look out with a number of connected devices, mm -hmm. um, whether it be mobile devices that we're walking around with our cell phones, or even sensors with electrical power meters and mm -hmm. everything else, mm -hmm. or even when you go out into the automobile itself, there's mm -hmm. like over 200 devices on a car. Mm -hmm. uh, those devices are beginning to get connected to the Internet. Mm -hmm. So now you have, in essence, a mini cloud mm -hmm. driving around on a highway. Uh, and so this is perhaps, I think, the greatest example for why networking is so critical to cloud computing, because now we need to be able to have the security associated with, with these network devices because mm -hmm. I may want to have my car talk to another car to look ahead to see what the traffic jam is about, but I certainly don't want somebody uh, messing around with my brakes as sure, I'm going. Sure, sure. So I think security becomes really important, end-to-end -end connectivity becomes important, 
and even things such as 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 where, you know wide area optimization, application app, uh, acceleration, and everything wow. becomes important because you need to be able to find the quality um, that you you need to to be able to deliver these yeah. kind of services. It makes sense, I guess. That's a good segue into the money question, which is what is Cisco's cloud strategy? We've heard a lot of business groups around the company um, talk about how they play in the cloud. But if you had to really sum it up as a company, what is Cisco's cloud strategy? Because if you're talking cars, you're talking routers, many different types of devices, many different things that sometimes you don't hear about in cloud discussions. What mm -hmm. is the cloud strategy well, for the company? So as, as a company, we have a very simple, uh, straightforward cloud strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, uh, it's very easy to use a cloud, mm -hmm. but building a cloud is quite a challenge. Mm. And so to help people who are building clouds themselves today, that's where we provide the essential infrastructure components, mm -hmm. uh, be in our core networking and switching routing uh, business, or also our unified computing systems, okay. which will make a larger building block for people to be able to use as they are building their own clouds. Uh, in the area where we like to work with partners most, particularly is in providing full end-to-end -end solutions. Okay. So this is for people who want to deploy cloud services, mm -hmm. largely in the service provider space. Mm -hmm. They would like to be able to deploy unified communications or collaboration, mm -hmm. uh, virtual desktops. Mm -hmm. uh, so we can package these things up with our partners, pre-integrating them, making it easier and quicker for people to deploy cloud services. Interesting. The third area, of course, is you know, draws upon Cisco's roots in innovation, mm -hmm. is that we're really looking at the larger view of the cloud, mm -hmm. all going all the way out to the end user. Mm -hmm. And so what are the devices and what are the access points mm -hmm. that allow end users to access cloud services in a secure way? And so that's where you see our CS tablet, our, our mobile phone, everything else is going on in terms of the endpoints coming into the cloud. So, wow, what that basically tells me is we can contextually take different business groups, channel programs, products like UCS, WebEx, and ASA Firewall and say it maps to one or more of these three parts of our strategy. We can now, co in a concerted way, describe where each part of Cisco's business touches the cloud. Absolutely, and, and that's why we're stressing architectures as mm -hmm. well. Because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, you have to put these things together into mm -hmm. an architecture mm -hmm. to be able to deliver the value uh, that the customer needs to get out of the, out of the cloud itself. Excellent. Well, the last question I wanted to ask you it has to do with um, if you look at the future mm -hmm. of the cloud, um, how is the network really going to play a role in differentiating Cisco sure. uh, in the marketplace and just regardless of Cisco, networking in general? Well, it's networking and I think it's also system architecture. Okay. And that is actually dramatically changing, I think, the way data centers are going to be built. Okay. So if we're looking at what's going on in the data center today, in fact, I was talking with uh, one of the CEOs of one of our large customers, and we both ran up to a whiteboard and started mm -hmm. scribbling things around, trying to figure out why are data centers uh, so inefficient today compared to what we're seeing emerging in the market in cloud service providers. Mm -hmm. And it largely has to do with the fact that when you build out internal architectures that for you take an application, you put it on a server with an operating system, and then you move to the next application. Mm -hmm. And as you add more and more applications into the data center, each with their own individual architectures, you don't get any economies of scale. Mm -hmm. uh, you get very low utilization, mm -hmm. and you have enormous complexity because you've tied the applications to the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Instead, what we're doing with cloud computing today is we're saying, build a cloud over the infrastructure, turn the infrastructure itself into a service, mm -hmm. in which now the applications become virtualized. So the applications can pick whatever operating system they need, they're running on a virtual machine. They can be turned on, they can be turned off, they are essentially provided now on demand. Mm. So that means that now the IT organization and these future data centers can get scale very large to get efficiencies that way. They can become totally automated. Mm. Uh, and because now the, the infrastructure itself, main goal is simply to provide a pool of resources mm. that are used by the applications. And this is a much more efficient way to build out data centers and drive down the cost and increase the agility than for a company to respond. You said you said APIs, and I know that you've had an interesting perspective on that. Can you describe a little bit about, I know traditionally you would think, okay, well, UCS has a, has a role in mm -hmm. uh, the cloud for Cisco, or WebEx obviously already does as a SaaS play. But you have mentioned before that you're, you're part of the strategy is to actually build APIs into pretty much any networkable product that right. we sell right. that will touch the cloud right. directly or indirectly. Right. Can right. you elaborate and on that? So Which, what did you mean by in, that? In, as in well? fact, John Chambers himself has been talking about the network as a platform. Yes. When you say a network is a platform, what you're really talking about is ways to build other applications on top of that. The applications themselves 
need to have APIs in terms of managing the resources. Mm -hmm. So that by creating this kind of network platform that is driven through programmatic APIs, mm -hmm. we can do things such as automate. Mm -hmm. We also can build systems such as UCS, which is driven by APIs, so mm -hmm. that now software itself can do all of the provisioning. So you can take a much larger view of now these things and make these building blocks that make a lot more sense. It's no longer the individual uh, switch or the individual router. It's really the system that... that comprises the network that makes it really work here. Gotcha. So what, we're, what we're talking about are pre-configured building blocks. That's right. Exactly. In right. the end. That's right. Okay. Well, I really appreciate you taking time out with us. Uh, I know a lot of people were anticipating hearing from you, and I'm sure we're going to be hearing a lot from you in the next weeks, months, and years to come. For everyone who is listening to Lou today, I'm sure you'll hear more from him soon. Thanks again for joining us. Well, thanks, thanks for joining much. us today, Lou. Thank you, and have a great day.